she said, I didn't know what we were going to do about you for college. She said, I didn't know if you were even going to end up going because you know we can't pay for it. When I first went, I wanted to, I thought I was going to be out two years after, but unfortunately my, that's not what um, what's happening now. But for a lot of majors, your prerequisites and general courses, it can take you up to three years to complete. And that's what I'm at right now because I'm still completing those prerequisites and general courses. We don't need m new buildings, we don't need more money handouts, we, we need information and the resources readily available, not bureaucracy, not paperwork, uh, a, a human being to talk to and walk us through this process. Online classes are challenging. They're not easy. And so if you don't have the motivation or the drive to do it, then it's a good chance you may not succeed. A non-traditional student is more than just a student. They're a veteran, they're also an employee somewhere, they're a parent, they're a wife or a husband or a caretaker of someone. I don't think that universities really understand the balancing act that they're trying to, to manage um, and how really hard that can be and stressful and overwhelming that can be um, mentally and financially. We know that there continues to be a very strong and always regenerating pipeline of students who come directly out of high school and are looking for the next step in their lives. So we'll always talk about those students. And uh, what we have now added, though, is a population of people who may not be done yet. Uh, and those, those individuals come from all walks of life. They come from all sectors of the economy, but it's something that we're continuing to have to grapple with as educators and as policymakers to figure out how do we accommodate these individuals? How do we make it accessible? How do we make it affordable? Across the country, there are millions of students trying to make a path toward college. But they don't just want degrees. These students want better lives for themselves and their families. Here we share the stories of five such students, Sharon, Traval, Donald, Janelle, and Andrea. Each of them is on a different path, yet the obstacles they encounter make for a shared experience. Information, preparation, finances, time, life. We share their stories not because they are unique, but instead because they are all too common. Like them, a majority of students now access higher education in non-traditional ways. We share their stories, their successes, and their setbacks, so that we might better support these students on their journey into and through higher education. For them, for all of us. Family has always been very important to me. I've always said academics comes first, but after that, it's my family. My mom is a single mom, and it's her and me and my two sisters. I could go to college and say, I'm going to get a good degree so I can get money for myself. I want to be rich. I want to spoil myself. But that's not really what I want. What I want is to get a good, stable life and create one for my family, too. Sharon is a, a shining star in education. Uh, talk about dedication. 
She takes books home every night since seventh grade, and I only know her from the seventh grade, and this child has taken books home every day. She was willing to come in early, willing to stay late. You know, she doesn't have a computer at home, but she asked me, can I borrow your laptop? And she will work on all of her work so diligently, and you know, can you proof this for me, et cetera. I don't have ink at home. Can I send it to you? Will you print it out? Sharon has excelled academically, even though she has had to work throughout high school to help support herself and her family. If I didn't have to work through school, I wouldn't work through school. I would put all my time and dedication into it. With my paychecks I get from Sears, I pay for my car insurance, my cell phone bill, and my gas money. It doesn't provide me with just relief, but my mom too, because by paying for my own things, I really relieve some stress off of her. Despite the extra demands on her time outside of school, Sharon did not shy away from taking the tough courses she knew she needed to get ready for college. I'm taking AP English, AP Calc, and AP Chem. I knew that AP classes would be able to get me college credits if I put the time and effort into it now. She worked hard, picked the right classes. She picked tough classes to get through, but she also worked with the outside pressures of family and work. Sharon received a great deal of support from her high school and from the McGowan Hispanic Outreach Program at nearby King's College. During her junior year, Sharon's guidance counselor encouraged her to participate in the outreach program. As a result, Sharon was able to take advantage of many services provided by the college, such as its dual enrollment and summer residential programs. She also took a course that prepared her for the college application process. Over a 10-week period, these students are actually doing something that they'll be doing during their senior year. This is what the essay is like. This is how you get ready for the SATs. This is how you go about finding out where the money is. This is how you go about researching colleges. Sharon Flores. Thank you. Congratulations. When I think of the main challenges that students like Sharon face, the most challenging part is how am I going to fund this? Where am I going to get the money from? After working so hard and for so long to prepare for college, Sharon was discouraged when she found out that the school she applied to only provided enough financial aid to cover half the cost of attendance. I was honestly very disappointed when I saw that I only got half paid for. I had done so well, I had done so much, and I still had so many questions about how I could fill in the rest of that, that empty gap with money. When I applied for the McGowan Scholarship, that's where I knew everything had to fall into place. If I got the McGowan, it was King's College for me. If I didn't, I would have to honestly reconsider my college decisions, whether I was going to go to a community college or not. The McGowan Scholarship covers not just the tuition, but also room and board, because we believe it's important that the, that the students have the experience of living on campus. It was a Friday afternoon. I was coming home from school and I saw that I had mail in, in the mailbox. And I read it over and I say, oh my God, I got it. And I started crying. At that moment, my mom is sitting on the couch in the corner. She's just looking into space and I tell her, mom, are you okay? She starts crying too. She told me, I'm just so happy you got it. My mom was crying out of relief. I was crying out of joy. When you look at the rates with which low-income students go to college, um, they're much lower. They're about 50% lower than they are for high-income students. Even when you look at low-income students who are doing things like taking Algebra 2 or scoring high on SAT scores, I think there's a real myth that it's, oh, they're not as well prepared or they're not doing the courses. Well, the funny thing is that even when they are as well prepared, they're still going to college at a much, much lower rate because poverty is still a real barrier. You know, Sharon came in one morning and said, Ms. Pride, I, I have a problem. I had to make a tough decision. And I said, what was that? She said, I'm not going to be able to live on campus. I'm like, why? You earned this. If I moved out, my mom would lose my help, whether it was financially or emotionally. So I didn't really want to leave her with that burden. Moving away from home, particularly in the Hispanic community, can be a little bit difficult because the family unit is so strong. So to move out of the family unit and live on a college campus can be a challenge. After some deliberation, Sharon decided to live on campus after all. Her mother moved in with a family friend, reducing the emotional and financial support Sharon needed to provide. 
I chose King's College because I've always been connected to them. It just felt like a family there to me. It, on it only felt right to leave one family to go into another. As a caregiver, I do work with the intellectual disabled, Alzheimer's, MS, or Down syndrome, and it's just basically helping them get through their every day-to-day -day living, helping them with things that they cannot do. It's that experience that I'm going to need in the nursing school. Traval currently attends Northern Virginia Community College, or NOVA. After completing his prerequisite courses, he hopes to transfer to nearby George Mason University and to be admitted into their competitive nursing program. While Traval began his journey into higher education at the local community college, his educational journey actually began with his parents, who immigrated to the United States from Ghana. They purposely came here to have children and give their children a better life, a better opportunity. They come here working three jobs or long hour shifts, working seven days a week. We ask a question on our application, are you the first in your family to go to college? Often that is a barrier for students. They would be the first in their family to go to college, and their parents may be from another country and not familiar with the United States educational system. My mom has a lot of friends that she grew up with in Ghana, and they're, they're, they have children um, who go to, go to college. She also gets information from them. So my mom, I think she probably thought the loans were the same thing as FAFSA. And then, you know, her consulting with friends, you know, those loans are crazy. So the moment I said free money, she's like, no, Cheval, there's no such thing as free money. It's a trap. You're going to have to pay them back. And the interest rate is, is ridiculous. With this misconception, Traval graduated from high school without ever having applied for financial aid. FAFSA, as it's known, is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid and is the gateway for federal financial aid. While in college, Traval learned the difference between loans and grants and then filled out the FAFSA after he had already enrolled, but found completing it on his own difficult. When you do that on your own and you don't have someone who's professional and who's experienced with filling out FAFSA, it gets really confusing. You end up putting in things that you know you don't even understand, but you end up putting something that you think you know, but at the end of the day, it's probably a wrong answer. And that's what I feel probably affected me not getting any financial funds the first time I applied for um, FAFSA. Freshman year is not the time to start educating students on how to fund their education. I would say, let's start it in middle school. My mom had to work for each and every semester and pay like at least two grand, if not then at least three grand a semester. It's just so much responsibility for my parents and they're already paying for my tuition out of pocket and sometimes I just feel like paying tuition plus bugs and parking passes, it's just too much. So the little that I can do to help them, I'm just down for it. And that's what keeps me going to, you know, work those long hours. I think what we, sh we struggle with is the students who um, have to, for, some, for whatever reason, work full time. So then they decrease the number of credits. So then they're here longer. The traditional length of time students here is two year, two year, two year. But our students are taking three and a half, on average three and a half years to get through the community college and then transfer into um, the four year schools. So when I met Traval, I asked Traval what his GPA was. He was very proud to tell me he at that time had like a 3.8. And since having to start this job where he's, these 30 hours have come into play, um, he has slipped. So he will be retaking that course. Traval also learned that two of the courses he had been advised to take would not count toward George Mason's nursing program. Although it is unclear why Traval was advised to take these courses, the advisors at NOVA recognize that keeping up with changing course requirements is a problem that transfer students like Traval confront. There are a few challenges that occur for transfer students. Each year or each semester, the receiving institution, that four-year school, can make a policy change. Then that four-year institution would communicate the policy change to us. And then it's like a trickle down. It's ever changing for them and they have to 
constantly be caught up on what what's the new change. She'll tell you take this class and take this class and you find yourself at Nova for like three to four, five, six years and not everyone do, needs that. It's people's times, people's lives, and people's money and you don't want to waste any of those three aspects. Traval recently attended an orientation at George Mason to make sure he was on the right track to transfer. While he learned that he was taking the right courses, he also learned more about how well he needs to do in those courses to get into the nursing program. It's, it's competitive. That was definitely an eye-opener to me that, you know, I can't be a C student, I can't be a B student, I just need to shoot for those A's and work hard for them. So that can increase my chances of getting into um, nursing school. You see, there's institutional access and then there's programmatic access. Too many low wealth minority black and brown people do not have program access. They get into an institution, but they don't get into programs. And so when you jump down the line and you look at the end product, how many STEM baccalaureate, masters, and PhD people do we have who are persons of color, first generation, low wealth? It's a very small number. Despite the setbacks, Traval remains focused and motivated to reach his goal. Once we get there, I feel like we'll figure out the way. I've already seen the tuition for on-campus and off-campus for School of Nursing at George Mason. And there's no way that me, my mom, my dad, our income can just pay it all out of the blue. So most likely we're going to have to take out a loan and see what other opportunities are out there. I'm an optimistic thinker, so it's a must. I know my hard work will not go in vain. I will get into George Mason School of Nursing, so I don't have a plan B. Growing up, I just remember having a lot of respect for my dad, a lot of respect for those who serve others. A lot of my values that I have today were instilled in me from my father, and I would assume he got them from his father and the military. My grandpa served, my uh, great-grandpa served. I wouldn't say it's, I joined because of it's family tradition, I joined because something was compelling me to serve others, and I wanted to do that through the military. When uh, I was looking for colleges, uh, I was also looking for colleges that had ROTC programs, so I could eventually become an officer like my father. South Dakota State University was my preferred choice. Out of all those col three colleges that I visited, they're the only ones that really made me feel like an individual. When I went to South Dakota State University, there were about eight of us, and somebody actually went out to, to assign and changed and put our names up there with the little letters by hand. You know, welcome Donald Richards and all the other individuals. In 2005, Donald enrolled at South Dakota State University and would go on to major in medical laboratory sciences. He completed his freshman year successfully with A's and B's and looked forward to graduating within the next three years. Eight years later, however, Donald is still enrolled at SDSU trying to finish his degree. Between what would have been his sophomore and senior year, Donald was deployed twice, once to Iraq and the second time to Afghanistan. While he found a sense of purpose serving, Donald also found reintegrating back onto campus presented many challenges. The adjustment and coping for that first semester back was, uh, was difficult to say the least. The first thing I wanted to do was run back to Iraq. I wanted to, to volunteer for the next unit going over there because I wanted that feeling back. I wanted the feeling that I was useful, that I was contributing. Uh, and I wasn't getting it from, from home life, and I wasn't getting it from, from, from academia. All of these veterans are non-traditional students. So these folks have been removed from the college classroom or from the civilian atmosphere for multiple years, one or more combat deployments, and then they're making the transition back in. Donald faced many challenges transitioning back to school. The first was reintegrating into civilian life. I wasn't coming down off of the, the hyper, they call it hypervigilance overseas. Certain sounds startled me, I wasn't able to get to sleep. Um, somewhat like PTSD-like symptoms. Um, I, had, I had nightmares, I was screaming in my sleep. Donald sought counseling from the resources provided by the Army, but found the travel distance required to access these services a major barrier. I tried to utilize those resources, but I found them uh, more work than they were really worth. Because we're in the Midwest, a lot of their focus were on high population areas, like your Twin Cities, that's four hours away. What I ended up using was uh, 
on-campus counselor. It was nice having that to, some of that somebody to talk to, but it was really difficult to, to relate to her and to, to express to her the experience overseas and try to get advice on how to cope. The second challenge for Donald would be reintegrating back into academic life. I don't know how, how to articulate the feelings like, like I didn't belong because I'm surrounded by these individuals that, that know what's going on and I feel just stupid. You're surrounded by all these bright individuals that haven't had this break, this, this long break, that are picking it up left and right and, and you're still stuck with, stuck at like a basic concept. Through a diagnosis by the VA, Donald learned his academic struggles were caused not just from his time away from school, but also due to a slight traumatic brain injury he had suffered while in Iraq. He sought and received support for the issues affecting his short-term memory and concentration from SDSU's Office for Disability Services. In addition to needing academic and personal help, Donald faced a third challenge, accessing his financial aid. Veterans have to navigate two bureaucracies, and that's an incredible challenge. They have to navigate the bureaucracy that every student has to navigate, and that is of higher education, of the campus that they're enrolling on, uh, and getting financial aid through the Department of Education. But the second bureaucracy they have to navigate is the Department of Veterans Affairs and getting their GI Bill benefits. And that's incredibly complex. I wasn't able to start back up my, my GI Bill right away because I really didn't understand how that process worked. Now that I've been deployed, the GI Bill is different for deployed soldiers. You can upgrade to different programs that give you more money or more benefits. Trying to call the VA Help Center and then getting answers that uh, weren't really answering the question. Had you done this while you were overseas, then you would be eligible for this really good one, but since you didn't do that, you're only eligible for this. And not, have, not being given that information, I felt a little bit, um, a little bit of anger because if that information had been given to me, I would have participated. Lack of information on how to access his aid was just one of Donald's financial concerns. He also had to deal with the impact of the political stalemate that crippled the nation throughout 2013, like sequestration and the government shutdown, both of which had a negative effect on the availability and adequacy of Donald's military education benefits. The tuition assistance mixed with the Pell Grant used to cover everything and everything, and it was pretty much worry-free for me. I would never get a bill in the mail. They did reinstate federal tuition assistance, but um, from what I understand from the cashier's office, there's more stipulations on it now and that the stipulations fluctuate. Some years they're covering certain fees and some years they're saying, no, that fee's not allowed. So now I'm now responsible for some sort of an $800, $800 bill, which I have to go to SDSU and pay. I've expressed, expressed myself to the VFW, what are the lobbyists for the VFW doing on Capitol Hill to, to make them aware of this issue. And a lot of the stuff I've gotten back is they feel that the post 9-11 GI Bill covers us well enough that they don't need the program. I still worry about the junior soldiers who don't have the deployment like I do. Today I'll be receiving a award for continuing education, meaning that I was an individual who was determined on finishing school no matter what. Next, we have our Outstanding Continuing Education students. The first award goes to Janelle Holder of University of Maryland, University College. Thank you very much. In high school, my academic record was pretty high. I had a GPA of about 4.0. I know I wanted to attend college at one point in my life. I thought I wanted to go right after high school. Janelle was actually on track to become valedictorian of her class at Potomac High School in Prince George's County, Maryland. But her family moved during her senior year, disrupting her college planning and separating her from her support system. Knowing she was an excellent student, the counselors at her new school tried to intervene to get Janelle back on track for college. But concerns about how to pay for it put college even further out of reach for her despite graduating as salutatorian from her new high school. They had a conversation with my mom, and she just couldn't do it. She wasn't making a whole lot of money. And at that point, I made a decision to just pursue it at another time. I always believed I'll get it done, but I'm not going into debt for it. And so that's why I, I didn't go to, to college right out of high school. My main goal was to make sure that I was always employed. 
And then from there, I felt like if I was employed, then I would be able to support myself and go to school. Janelle worked for several years after high school, enrolling briefly at Prince George's Community College in Maryland. She attended for only one semester. Janelle found it difficult to find a steady job earning a decent wage. She came to rely on the Prince George's County Workforce Development Services when work was hard to find. You go there periodically to look for jobs, to fill out your resume, to get support from some of the advisors there. And I had been there quite a few times. After several years of using the services at the center, Janelle was encouraged by one of the career services consultants, Pete Goodson, to try a different route. I went there and said, oh, Mr. Goodson, I need a job. And he's like, Janelle, I think I've mentioned to you quite a bit, you need to go back to school. And I'm like, I'm not ready for that right now. I can't afford to just go to school. He's like, I'm telling you, I have a really good program. It's perfect for you. Here it is, this span of nine years, and I still haven't made it where I thought I was gonna make it by now. I was searching for work, trying to get steady employment, wondering, are my dreams dying? And I said, you know what? It cannot hurt. Let me go back. Janelle was accepted into the University of Maryland University College through BOTO, or the Better Opportunities Through Online Education Scholarship Program. The program was designed to help full-time working adults return to school by completing a certificate program entirely online. The program not only waived tuition for Janelle, but also provided her with other types of financial support. Once I entered into the certificate program, BOTO automatically gave you your technology stipend, gave you your computer, and gave you your books. Janelle received personalized support from the director of UMUC's scholarship program. Sonia Marie has been the perfect liaison for working with UMUC and getting all of the classes into the program. She was registering me for classes. She was ordering all of my books. She was basically my main point of contact for this entire program for the entire time. Having completed the certificate program, Janelle is now working toward her bachelor's degree in accounting. Again, with the support of her advisor, as well as from a donor from the local community who is covering her tuition expenses. Janelle hopes to complete her bachelor's degree by the end of next year, six years after starting at UMUC. It's been this long, very long road. When you're an adult learner, you, you may not finish your degree in four years. You may need six, eight, ten years to do it. And that can be discouraging. We have to remind them that it's not about when am I going to finish? It's, it's about finishing. The University of Maryland University College program is definitely not to be taken lightly. The coursework is rigorous. It's flexible in that you do not have to leave work and go sit into a traditional classroom. While Janelle has done well in all of her courses so far, she currently has a 3.9 GPA. She is actually facing a new hurdle late in her program, remedial math. This class has been tough. I was ultimately trying to see what my grade is for my midterm, and I thought I at least did a B, but I ended up getting a high C, and I'm a little disappointed. Despite having successfully completed the accounting courses for her major while in the certificate program, Janelle was placed into remedial math when taking her general education requirements for her bachelor's degree. Janelle found that while she excels at the applied math in her accounting courses and in her job, she currently works as the finance and accounting manager at a local nonprofit. She wasn't as prepared as she thought to tackle college algebra after being out of high school for more than a decade. Like they say, if you don't use it, you lose it. So obviously I lost it. It's clear, it's evident. I probably do need to reach out now and, and try to, to learn and figure out what resources I need to do better. So after seven years in the radio industry, I had pretty much done all that I could. I wasn't making very much at the radio station, only about $24,000 a year. It came to a point where I had to decide if I was going to stay in this industry or try to pursue some other job. But what am I going to put on my resume? That's all I knew was radio. I had to go to school to give myself more opportunities other than the radio industry. In returning to school, Andrea would have to overcome many challenges, the first being her academic past. 
So in high school, I didn't take academics seriously because I didn't have the confidence in it. Nobody ever told me that I could do good in school. As far as my school counselor, she did meet with me and talk to me about what my plans were after high school. And when I told her that I wanted to go play basketball for CU, she totally dissed that idea and said, you know what, I don't think college is for you. She handed me a pamphlet about joining the military. So right then and there, I was kind of told college wasn't for me. After graduating high school, Andrea did in fact attend college at Western State Colorado University, but left after only one semester. Over the next few years, Andrea also tried, unsuccessfully, to attend both Front Range Community College and Colorado State University. After attending Colorado State briefly, she left school to get a full-time job and along the way got married and started a family. Fast forward seven years later and I'm thinking about going back to school and then it's all got a piece together. Math was a huge hiccup for me. In high school, I think my math teacher just passed me just to get rid of me. <laughs> so I had to start down at the bottom when I went to Front Range to work my way up to even pass my college algebra class. Getting out of the lowest level of remediation is a challenge most students fail. But for three semesters, Andrea successfully worked her way through her math requirements. Then, she prepared for her next challenge, transferring to Colorado State University. So I have to do the research and make the phone calls and write the emails and, you know, fill out the forms to get my official transcripts from Western State, Front Range, and CSU the first time and get those ready to take over to CSU. So it was a lot of like shuffling and mixing around when I went back the second time. I chose CSU because I had a family and I couldn't move and go to some university that I wanted to because that means we'd have to pack up the whole family and that wasn't an option. So when I returned to CSU as a non-traditional student 10 years later, I was on academic probation my first semester here at CSU. But working with the Educational Opportunity Center and the Academic Advancement Center, they really helped me to get over that hump and support me. And then right after that first semester, I was off of academic probation. And she knew she wasn't going to be alone when she went to Colorado State University because I was going to be there, Academic Advancement Center was going to be there. We were there to help her. At the suggestion of an advisor, Andrea applied for and won the Educational Opportunity Partnership Scholarship. To receive the scholarship, however, Andrea had to enroll in college full time, and that meant making some difficult sacrifices. I needed to quit my job at the radio station, which was a full time job with health insurance benefits. So now all of a sudden, I'm losing this income and these benefits. So the way that I replaced it um, was by going to the Department of Human Services and applying for food stamps and Medicaid for me and my family. Yes, my husband's working, but we don't make enough to pay for things like health insurance and, and food. It was great because we needed the help. That's how the kids stayed healthy, and that's how we were fed during the winter months and stuff. So, I mean, it's a, it's a blessing that, that we could fall back on it, but I try not to not to talk about it too much, just I don't want people to know that, that we're struggling so much, you know. The daily struggles of whether or not they can actually pay for their basic needs or the basic needs of their children or their families, or whether or not they can invest into their futures or the futures of their children and their families are really the hard trade-offs that they have to make. The funny thing about our country is we have so many wonderful resources to support families, but they come down in so many different programs um, through so many different states, and it's really confusing. My scholarships and my grants paid for my tuition and my books, but there was still some life things that needed to be paid for, like car fix-ups or daycare or rent, and that's where the school loans fit in. So when you would fill out your financial aid stuff and you had that question, come up on your computer asking you if you wanted any school loans, you kind of just look around in desperation and just check the box, not really thinking of the consequence. Then when it comes to when you're actually graduating, all those things that you kind of bypassed and let go just to survive and get through each semester comes down into one huge email that tells you that you have $30,000 in loans. Too many students graduate uh, with, with too much loan debt. Uh, there's too much unmet need. Uh, for low-income students, the loan policy is insane. 
Uh, it should we should never expect the low-income Americans to have to borrow money to go, to go to college. It's just wrong. Despite the many obstacles she has faced, Andrea has truly beat the odds. With the academic and financial support provided by the Educational Opportunity Center, Andrea has surpassed the low expectations of her past and is on a path that she and her entire family can be proud of. I mean, it's still so surreal to me to say that, you know, a year ago, in the spring of 2012, I was on the Dean's List with a 4.0. Like, what? Me? Andrea? No. There's no way that I should be on the Dean's List. But I think I surprised myself by finding out that I'm smart. For so long, I heard this little voice in the back of my head saying, I can't, I shouldn't go to college, I'm not that smart, I really don't have anything to offer. But then all of a sudden, I'm doing it. So when my kids were present at my graduation, and even my husband, it was nice for them to see that final piece, like, wow, this is what it's all about. And she did it, we did it. It was a moment of triumph and celebration that what we've all endured as a family over the last three years of me going to school full time was well worth it. They're missing the, uh, the whole notion of human capital. They're missing that uh, the, the greatest resource that we have is other human beings. And that the course that we're going on is they're, they're, they're dooming uh, future generations. Well, I think it's important to, to remind policymakers that are in charge of budget allocations that certain line items aren't just an expense. And I think when we invest in our human capital, when we invest in higher education and the opportunity for students to go to college, when we invest in financial aid, those are investments that pay off. We persist in trying to change students as opposed to being willing to change the institutional practices that have been in place for far too long. But we have not truly empowered the institution through the allocation of the resources and the accountability metrics to achieve the success that we say that we want. A future in which the access issue was solved uh, would be one where colleges and universities were uh, very much a part of their, their communities, as they are now, uh, but they would feed the, the economy, they would feed industry, they would feed the, the political structure in, in every community, and, and people would feel like they belong, which is maybe one of the most important challenges that we face now, is that there are so many people who think education is out of their reach. What a degree means to me is that all your hard work did not go in vain. What a college degree means for me is getting a, a better paying job, of course, but really uh, I want to be a more productive member of society, a more knowledgeable member of society. I want to contribute in a positive way. What a degree means to me is an opportunity for a progression. I can move not only myself forward, but my family. It means not only that I've worked hard for it, but to thank all the people that have gotten me to that point. I know that without them, I wouldn't have had the motivation to do it. What a college degree means to me is now passion, success, and accomplishment. What my college degree means for me is hope. Um, for the longest time, I didn't know what I had to offer the world. I thought it was nothing. I was just kind of walking through the steps of life and unsure where I belonged and what my purpose was. Um, of course, as a mother and a wife, I do have purpose, but I know that there's more to me than just that. I know I have more to offer the world. I have hope, and I have hope not for myself, but also for my children and 
for other non-traditional students and as a teacher, hope for my future students.